Hello again. This is the second part of my reading the paper, The Arts After Darwin, Does Art Have an Origin and Adaptive Function? by Ellen DeSanayaka. In the first part of the essay, Ellen DeSanayaka explained why she thinks it's helpful to think of art as an adaptive function and lays out some of the existing hypotheses of how art may have helped us survive in the Darwinian sense. However, she argues most of the existing hypotheses aren't really general enough or are skewed by Western notions of what art is. In the second half of the paper, which I am about to read to you, the author lays out her own hypothesis about the adaptive function of art, which she argues is more universal. The purpose of reading this essay is to help answer the question which has started to form around this podcast. What is the value of art? Whether we talk about value on the market or aesthetic value, the conversation around that question seems muddled. I personally find looking at it from an anthropological and specifically evolutionary perspective helpful, at least partially. But after listening, let me know if you do too. So with no further ado, here is the second half of Ellen DeSanayaka's Arts After Darwin. We're continuing with subchapter four, A Common Denominator of Art. Scholars versed in historical, anthropological, or philosophical studies of the arts are well aware of the complexities inherent in conceptualizing their subject. They appreciate that orthodox Western notions of aesthetics and art, that art is rare, elite, original, individual, and costly, that it is synonymous with or closely related to concepts of beauty, skill, creativity, imagination, representational accuracy, or self-expression, that it is composed of autonomous objects, paintings, sculptures, ceramics, or activities, dances, songs, performances, that it is the province of specialist artists, quote-unquote, are derived from enlightenment ideas and are by no means universally held or practiced. Moreover, most human societies have no concept of art in the Western sense of an overreaching category that includes such diverse entities as paintings, carvings, songs, dances, and literature. So she's just describing the orthodox Western notion of art and how it differs from a more anthropological and therefore universally human notion of art. Most contemporary evolutionists lack this new and broader understanding of art. So I guess she's saying that even evolutionists lack this understanding of art, even though I guess the broader understanding of art would be an anthropological uh, notion of art as opposed to a Western uh, aesthetic notion of art. Most contemporary evolutionists lack this new and broader understanding of art. In this respect, their assumptions about art and art theory are as outdated and beside the point as are most art theorists' assumptions about evolutionary theory. Yet those who have a sophisticated knowledge of art today, the humanists, adhere to the axiom that there cannot be a common denominator that characterizes art. For most such scholars today, art is only a socially constructed concept. So she's saying that the kind of predominant uh, approach to art is that it is a socially constructed concept. And she, of course, argues that it is a, a biological um, and evolved human characteristic, that, that it is sort of encoded in, in all of our DNA. Unfortunately for an evolutionist who wishes to consider art as an evolved component of human nature, there must be some universal proclivity or features that selection could have acted on, something that encompasses all instances pre-modern, modern, and post-modern, and can be shown to have a plausible evolutionary origin and adaptive function or functions. So this is the whole argument of the essay, that she wants to create a universal and truly anthropologically informed description of what art is. And she argues that basically no one has done it, and that um, very often anthropologists who often come from, you know, what's called Western countries, have a very um, Western-centric notion of art, which then makes it impossible for them to really formulate some kind of uh, real Darwinian hypothesis of what art uh, might actually be for. She argues that all the hypotheses that we heard in the last section about what um, art may have evolved to be are kind of too narrow and perhaps oftentimes um, inf too informed by a Western notion of art. 
One worthwhile effort to find such a common denominator is that of Dutton in 2000, who in the spirit of Weitz in 1959 and Monroe in 1963 used a, quote, family resemblance notion of art and made a provisional list of eight characteristics which, in whole or large part, will apply to the practice of art across cultures and throughout historical time. Giving pleasure in itself, exhibiting specialized skill, being made in a recognizable style according to formal rules, lending itself to critical discourse of judgment and appreciation, representing or imitating real and imaginary experience of the world, being the product of conscious intention by a maker, being, quote, bracketed or set off from ordinary life, and serving as an imaginative experience for both producers and audiences. Dutton's list is a valiant and useful attempt to delineate universal characteristics of the arts across cultures, but six of the features, i.e. specialized skills, styles, and rules, critical evaluative language, representation, conscious intent, and imaginative embodiment, characterized, as Dutton admits, examples of non-art as well. In this respect, they are like the features assembled to characterize art by the evolutionary hypotheses described in section 3. Only intrinsic pleasures, self-reward, and bracketing seem more or less restricted to art or art-like activities, such as play and make-believe or ritual behavior. See Dysoniaca 1988 and 1992. She actually often references her own writing because um, Dysoniaca really is a kind of seems to have this subject of art anthropology kind of cornered. So she's saying here, she's pointing out one list from the year 2000 that's inspired by these earlier efforts in 59 and 63 that give these six characterizations of art. But she says, you know, they still, still they fall into uh, the trap of also describing things which are not art. Like which she says, our specialized skill applies also not to art. Styles and rules applies to non-art. Critical evaluative language applies to not art. Representation replies to non-art. Conscious intent replies to non-art. And imaginative embodiment applies to non-art. I would actually like to know how. Maybe she describes that later, or she probably describes that in, in, in more depth in her books, in her full-length uh, monographs. Past and present Western theories of art have considered art as an artifact, a work or object of a certain kind, say a painting, mask, song, or literary work. An essential attribute that makes a work or object art, like disinterested appreciation, beauty, skill, costliness, and preference, a cue to something else, so they also might see a, uh, art as a cue to something else, like the presence of a deity, virtuosity, and creativity, which denote good genes, or as an activity or behavior, like making or displaying. As explained earlier, however, artifact, essence, and cue are problematic defining features for an adaptationist account of art because they do not pertain to many important instances of the arts in small-scale societies, and they beg the question of what art is. Again, she's just saying all of this research has, has only covered this subject partially, and I, she's, she's, it's like a, a academic drum roll. She's working her way up to saying what her idea is that she thinks is truly universal of art. An ethological, which is to say bio-behavioral perspective, may be helpful here. Um, ethology is the study of animal behavior, apparently, which includes us. Ethology um, is, I think, from what I've heard, is often considered like kind of a more ethical way almost of, of understanding animals because you're understanding them as a part of their environment and you're not disturbing them, you're just observing them as they behave in, in nature. When studying courtship, parenting, and other characteristic activities of an, an animal's life, ethologists describe what individuals do or accomplish when they court, parent, and so forth. Art, too, can be regarded as a behavior by describing what people do or accomplish when they make something art, when they artify. There is that word which Dysoniaca has coined, artification, where she argues we should, we, could, we should think of art as a verb more than a noun. It is easier to conceptualize art as behavior if we think of art as music, chanting, singing, playing an instrument, or performing, dancing, reciting, miming, acting, telling a story, since these arts take place like behavior in time. In a similar way, one can also think of the plastic or visual arts as making, marking, image making, adorning in any medium. That is, as the process or activity rather than the product or outcome of the artifying. 
but it is not immediately evident what, if anything, these various activities accomplish or have in common. This is just such suspense right now. I can't wait for her to actually <laughs> give us her hypothesis on this. In earlier publications, Dysoniaca, 1988, 1992, 1995, again, she's referencing herself, I suggested a common denominator for a behavior of art that I called making special. Again, making special is Dysoniaca's kind of special term that she uses. I claimed that in all instances of this behavior, in all times and places, ordinary experience, i.e. ordinary objects, movements, sounds, utterances, surroundings, is transformed, is made extraordinary. For example, in dance, ordinary bodily movements of everyday life are exaggerated, patterned, embellished, repeated, made special. In poetry, the usual syntactic and semantic aspects of everyday spoken language are patterned by means of rhythm, rhyme, al alliteration, assonance, inverted, exaggerated, using special vocabulary and unusual metaphorical analogies, and repeated, made special. In song, the prosodic, intonational and expressive aspects of everyday language, the ups and downs of pitch, pauses or rests, stresses or accents, louds and softs, fasts and slows, are exaggerated, sustained, patterned, repeated, varied, and so forth, made special. In visual display, ordinary objects like the natural body, the natural surroundings, i.e. cave walls, logs, anthill mud, and common artifacts like house walls, canoes, are made special by cultural shaping and elaboration that make them more than ordinary. The notion of making special is congruent with similar formulations by others i.e. the notion of bracketing in Dutton in 2000 that she just mentioned, or defamiliarization, making strange, and foregrounding in literary studies. So it's interesting that she's using these terms more from literary studies and uh, maybe theater studies. The defamiliarization, I believe, is, is, is associated mainly with Brecht, um, who is a, a theater artist. I propose that making special, which I now use interchangeably with artifying. So artifying, she uses interchangeably with making special. That's, I think, an important thing to remember so that we don't get confused here. Is the ancestral activity or behavior that gave rise to and continues to characterize or imbue all instances of what today are called the arts. The term making special can be substituted for art in the six characteristics of an adaptation, see section one, or the first part of this reading, and it avoids the inadequacies and problems noted in the latter part of section three, which is also in the last part of the reading of this essay. It describes an important human propensity that other evolutionists have not seriously considered or examined. Although it does not deny the functions proposed by hypotheses A, B, and C described in section three, the concept of making special strongly supports hypothesis D, that artification is important in reinforcing sociality. So she says it actually, all these hypotheses that we heard in the last section uh, by other anthropologists and other researchers into the possible uh, adaptive functions of art, Dysoniaco's notion doesn't deny these other concepts. It simply en en encompasses them. She's saying that hers is a much broader uh, definition, which is much more universal. Um, and she also says that it most strongly supports um, hypothesis D, that artification is important to enforcing sociality. Unlike many of the hypotheses, the concept of making special proposes answers to the proximate questions, when or why, as well as to the operational questions of what is art. So she claims that making special not only covers when and why, but also the what of art. What is art and when and why do we make it? So subsection five, what, when, and why is something made special? Making special, not beauty or display, explains the difference between a collection of decorated yams and a field of wildflowers, or a headdress composed of the colored feathers of thousands of birds and the feathers on the bird itself. So that's what I was saying in the last section about the sunset. What's the difference between a sunset and the appreciation, the aesthetic appreciation of a sunset and the representation of a sunset? Beauty, virtuosity, skill, and costliness like individual sensory stimuli or preferences, are ingredients of the arts that are used to make something special. They're ingredients, but they're not uh, the basic um, and universal aspect of it, she, she is arguing. 
Rather than ask why people have art, that troublesome word, or why they create fictions, make music, or paint landscapes, the more fundamental evolutionary adaptive question is to consider why our ancestors intentionally began and continued, as we continue today, to make things special or extraordinary. Other species display their charms to prospective mates and make choices according to brain-based perceptual and cognitive preferences. Or, with markings that mimic another species, they deceive predators or rivals. But it is only humans who deliberately make bodies, materials, places, vocal sounds, physical movements, words, stories, and even ideas special. It is making special weirdness, strangeness, and unusualness, as well as beauty, costliness, or excessiveness, that requires evolutionary explanation. When and why do people do this? These are psychological as much as philosophical or art historical questions, and they demand an adaptive answer. So basically, she's reformulated. First, she said, we need to think of art simply as the act of making special. And now we can ask, okay, why do humans universally make special? And that kind of helps us reframe the question and arrive at a better answer, basically. My adaptationist hypothesis about the arts has three strands, origin, motivation, and manifestation. One, origin. Aesthetic predisposition and the operations of making special. Studies by developmental psychologists reveal universal features in the interaction of human mothers and their infants. Despite cultural variations, mothers and other adults everywhere talk to babies in a characteristically soft, high-pitched, and undulant voice, which babies prefer to typical adult conversational speech. Along with this special vocal behavior, adults engage infants' attention by the use of rhythmic body movements, touching, patting, stroking, hugging, and kissing, unusual facial expressions, gaze, sustained smiles, open mouth, widened eyes, raised eyebrows, and characteristic head movements, bobs, nods, and wags, in an almost ritualized way. These vocalizations, expressions, and movements are repeated, often with dynamic variations, loud and soft, large and small, fast and slow, in what can be called a multimedia performance. It's, I mean, I don't know if this is something or this is nothing, but I think of um, the romantic idea uh, that uh, they talked so much about in that essay, um, Another Art World, which I read in three parts um, on this uh, podcast recently. The idea that the, the romantics um, thought of this childlike freedom um, as the basis of being an artist and that actually the romantics thought, therefore we are all artists or we at least all began as artists before we suppressed it as adults. Um, and so this is almost like a little more anthropological um, nod, even though it focuses more on the behavior of the caretaker towards the child than the child. Yet it is more than an individual performance. Minute analysis of videotaped engagements of mothers and babies showed that the pair interact in remarkably close temporal unity, responding to each other in subtle yet precise ways. The mother varies her pace and rhythm in order maximally to fit in with or gently direct the baby's emotional state. The baby in turn responds to the mother's signals with kicks, hand and arm movements, facial expressions, head movements, and vocalizations of its own often as if participating in a mutually negotiated rhythmic pulse with complementary dynamics. Over much of the first year of the infant's life, the pair engage and disengage, synchronize and alternate, practicing their physical, psychological, and emotional attunement by means of these multimodal expressive signals. So there's this notion that a lot of artists are damaged um, I don't think it's it's really true, but it makes me think that, you know, maybe a lot of people who want to be artists, who want to spend their life being artists, maybe what distinguishes them is that um, artists have not yet resolved their, their childhood dynamics somehow. Because if art originates from this interaction between parents and children, the idea that some adults would want to continue doing it forever and others wouldn't uh, is interesting, right? Because of its spontaneous nature and widespread occurrence, mother-infant interactions, as described, is assumed to be an evolved, adaptive part of human nature. Among its many practical contributions to the baby's development are assisting emotional equilibrium, self and interactive regulation, socialization, language learning, and acquisition of the parental culture. By the way, you know, what's interesting there is that, of course, 
it would support the notion that the dominance of the arts by men um, and the idea of, of it being mostly a sexual uh, selection uh, kind of thing, uh, which kind of supports this idea that it's mostly for men to do and to do well, um, this kind of blows it out of the water, right? And I think this, I mean, th th this notion is truly Disanayaka's contribution. I mean, this is this, this idea that it originates in the interaction of, of uh, parents and children um, is, is really hers. It is important, though largely unrecognized, that the very components of the interaction are fundamentally aesthetic or proto-aesthetic. The signals used by adults to infants are formalized, simplified or stereotyped, exaggerated, repeated, and elaborated in visual, vocal, and kinetic gestural modalities. These features attract and sustain the infant's attention, maintain the engagement, and serve to bond the partners. So she's also talking about it in partner interaction um, in couples. They also create and satisfy anticipation. In the early months, babies require predictability. But at about five or six months of age, they start to enjoy suspense and surprise, as in games of peekaboo and this little piggy, <laughs> in which their expectations is, are manipulated. I suggest that the innate capacities and sensitivities that evolved originally between adults and babies to make and respond to proto-aesthetic, temporal, and dynamic manipulations, like formalization, exaggeration, repetition, elaboration, and delayed expectancy, comprised a, quote, behavioral reservoir from which early humans could draw when at a later point in evolution they began deliberately to artify. Notably, it is these same manipulations or operations that are used, intentionally and in varied ways, by artists in any medium when they artify, make something special. Almost any mask from geographical areas as widely separated as sub-Saharan Africa, the Arctic, and Oceania show the first four of these features. When masks are dance, manipulation of expectations take place like song, oratory, and musical accompaniment in time. So she's saying that these aspects um, of play with infants um, and children are then reflected and developed and um, reused in what we call art. Now, the question, of course, is why? So now we're moving to the second part of Disanayaka's argument about artification. Two, motivation, uncertainty, emotional investment, caring about, and coping. Like proponents of the neurocognitivist and evolutionary aesthetic hypothesis, which she described in the last section, I locate the antecedents of the arts in already evolved propensities. Unlike them, I suggest proximate motivations for what and why our ancestors might have gone on to develop these propensities outside their original context, here for artifying, making special by means of aesthetic operations. Humans, more than other animals, use wits rather than instincts to address the problems of their lives. For our species, what to do and how to live are rarely instinctive, but must be learned. Over the millennia of hominid evolution, the mind increasingly became a making sense organ. Interrelated powers of memory, foresight, and imagination gradually developed and allowed humans to stabilize and confine the stream of life by making mental, quote, connections between past, present, and future, or among different experiences or observations. So she's saying, actually, that there is some truth to uh, this hypothesis that art is there to kind of improve our cognition. But she suggests that her approach is different because she thinks um, these motivations are proximate motivations rather than ultimate motivations. We talked about the difference between those two in the last section. Proximate motivations are your immediate motivation for doing something. For example, it feels good. It tastes good. And then the ultimate motivation or the ultimate use is maybe one that you don't even know about, like that something is nutritious and then she describes the difference between how we survive and how most animals survive. We don't generally survive as much through instinct. We have them, but our superpower, the thing that distinguishes us, that we also have this thing called sense, uh, that we think of the future, we make hypotheses about what might happen. Humans could remember or even dwell upon good and bad things and imagine them happening again. One cost of this growing awareness of the desired possibilities and inevitable unpredictability of life was uncertainty, even anxiety. 
because the most conspicuous occasion for the arts in small-scale societies of today is in ritual ceremonies, this association of art and ceremony may hold a clue to the original motivation in ancestral humans for the co-opting and further development of the capacity to make and respond to proto-aesthetic operations that originated in mother-infant interactions. So she says that she, the fact that most uh, small-scale societies use artification, the, the act of making special around ceremonies that are kind of centered around the anxiety of the unpredictable, right? Is it going to rain? Are we going to um, have a successful hunt? She says that that holds a clue to why humans may have developed the, the, the kind of interactions between parents and infants into this adult activity, um, which we call art. What do ceremonies concern? The anthropological literature on ritual is vast and varied, but it seems safe to say that most ceremonies are about biologically important things, i.e. assuring or restoring subsistence, safety, fecundity, health, prosperity, and victory or successfully dealing with the bodily changes and emotional and social concomitants of sexual maturity, pregnancy, birth, and death. The liminal occasions for ritual ceremony are times of transformation and uncertainty. I suggest that uncertainty leading to emotional investment or caring about was the original motivating impetus for the human invention of religion and its behavioral expression making special. Religion and art are usually treated by anthropologists as aspects of culture, which according to conventional theory is opposed to biology. So again, she's going back to this notion that people separate culture from biology, but really they are two interdependent things. An adaptationist view, however, views the various components that are called culture as outgrowths of evolved psychological predispositions. In general, cultural knowledge and practices direct our attention to particular biologically significant things, i.e. ways to become a competent adult, to make a living, to rear children, and to maintain social relationships. Among these, quote, ways are language and traditions of toolmaking or subsistence practice. At some point, our ancestors had to care about the outcome of these biologically significant and valued events and states that were not always certain of attainment. Other animals in uncertain or conflicted circumstances frequently engage in displacement activities or evolved ritualized behaviors whose components are drawn from ordinary bodily movements used in everyday contexts such as grooming or locomotion, i.e. scratching, preening, moving back and forth. Oh, interesting. So she's actually taking this back to much more basic biology and how art might just be an outgrowth, a kind of more complex um, version of something that even animals do in moments of uncertainty. In the new uncertain context, these ordinary movements become more stereotyped, that is, exaggerated, patterned in space and time, and regularized, repeated. Such ritualized movements reduce the tension of this displaying animal at the same time as they signal its mood and intentions to conspecifics. Humans show displacement, sometimes called comfort movements, when they repeatedly tap a foot, wiggle a knee, or wind a strand of hair around a finger. Caged animals and university lectures pace. <laughs> That's a little joke, I think. Caged animals and university lecturers pace. So this is really interesting, actually, that she's actually identifying these these movements that even animals make when they're nervous or when when they don't quite have control over a situation to uh, comfort themselves and I guess she's identifying really art as an outgrowth of that I suggest that in uncertain circumstances that did not call for immediate pragmatic action that is were not matters of immediate fight flee or freeze responses which is to say moments that you can't really control our early human ancestors at some point found that performing repetitious, simplified, or stereotyped exaggerated sounds and movements, already part of their behavioral repertoire and noted above as displaced or ritualized movements, felt comforting and ultimately erased tension, particularly when performed in a coordinated fashion among members of a group. Perhaps this behavior first occurred during a frightening storm. Such a response was described in two different Melanesian societies by Mead and Malinowski, when villagers huddled together, chanting charms to calm the violent winds. I further to suggest that individuals in groups that responded to uncertainty in stressful circumstances with such coordinative practices 
would gradually have gained survival advantage over those in groups where each person acted individually or randomly. The tension reduction capability of coordinated voice and movement is evidenced in infancy when mother-infant engagement assists biobehavioral self-regulation and the development of infant homeostasis. So it is not far-fetched to suggest that the same antecedent mechanisms worked for similar ends in ancestral artification of movement and vocalization. Once these became culturally established as ritualized responses to recurrent, provoking circumstances, they could become further elaborated and institutionalized as ceremonies. So here she's really making a, a hypothesis for how art could have even originated. She imagines some, you know, early humans um, encountering something very frightening that they cannot immediately flee from or control, uh, like a storm, and that, you know, they found that these repetitive movements and perhaps chanting and doing it together in synchronicity re relieved this tension, and that this somehow may have kind of over generations developed into some kind of codified set of movements and rituals and sounds. I suggest that a fifth hypothesis, stress reduction, be added to the four adaptive functions described in section three. The temporal arts help individuals psychologically to cope with uncertainty. Okay, we've, I mean, we've kind of already said that. Malinowski remarked that the impetus to do something about our perceived needs is overwhelming. We need to express any strong emotion by some form of action. In times of anxiety, one may not know what action to take, and in fact, there may be no obvious practical course to follow. Prescribed behavioral coordination with others through moving and singing or chanting provides, quote, something to do. It additionally relieves tension and anxiety and instills a sense of coping, as is evidenced in countless ceremonial practices that are meant to address some vital but uncertain occasion. One sees this function of making special, for example, in performances of the lament, an ancient and widespread response to the loss by death or separation of a person or place to which one is attached, where natural weeping and wailing is subjected to aesthetic operations, formalization, and so forth, and becomes a musical, poetic, cultural artifact. So this is just a specific occasion of how the, the grief relief and the stress relief of losing someone and, and this wailing could actually be institutionalized because, I mean, I know that in to ancient Greece, there were, uh, I think, mostly women who whose job it was to wail at funerals. Um, so that's kind of a specific example of how a natural stress re uh, reduction response then becomes institutionalized into something like the the art of wailing. Relief of uncertainty or anxiety is not the only function of the arts, but making places and actions special continues to provide something to do and a means of coping, as was evident in the spontaneous public responses of Americans to the horrifying destruction of the World Trade Towers in September 2001. This was written in 2008, so I guess this was really fresh. It's kind of an outdated reference because I don't, I mean, I was quite young, but I remember that time. I don't remember exactly what the... Uh, spontaneous public responses were to the World Trade Center, frankly. So now we'll move to the third part of De Saniake's argument, which is three, manifestation, the invention and functions of ceremonial ritual. In, quote, traditional or, quote, subsistence societies, small-scale groups that are more like ancestral societies than recent, specialized, technologically complex societies with developed agriculture and writing, the primary context for artification, such as singing, drumming, dancing, dramatic performance, poetic language, and visual display, is in various kinds of ritual ceremony. Although anthropologists usually conceptualize ceremonies as part of a symbolic cognitive system, here I wish to point out that regardless of what meanings they convey, ceremonies are constituted of arts, again behavior and artifacts made special, and would not exist without them. In ceremonies, the arts attract attention, sustain interest, coordinate group effort, and provide emotional excitement and satisfaction, plausibly implying that the arts arose in human evolution as adjuncts to ceremonial behavior, rather than as independently evolved activities. So she's saying basically, from what we know, we can plausibly say that the arts evolved through ritual, rather than independently of it. 
In his essay, Religion and Society, from 1952, Radcliffe Brown unwittingly used adaptationist thinking when he claimed that religion has a function in society apart from whether it does for the participants what they want it to do or think it does. He found its, quote, ultimate function to be to regulate, maintain, and transmit from one generation to another sentiments on which the continuity of the society depends. One of the things kind of implied here, but that hasn't really been explicitly said, is that what seems to separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom is the fact that we pass down kind of complex knowledge that has been developed over generations. And we're able to do that uh, through language. But the idea here is that it's not just through language, but also through ritual that um, we pass down this knowledge. Radcliffe Brown's emphasis on emotion or sentiments begs for an additional clause that emphasizes that the arts are the crucial mechanisms in ceremonies for regulating, maintaining, and transmitting these sentiments. I view ceremonial arts as the behavioral counterpart of religious beliefs. In this, I also follow Radcliffe Brown, who proposed that religion in small-scale societies was less a matter of beliefs than of rights, indeed that belief was an effect of rights, which he further described as positive and negative actions and abstentions. Beliefs and doctrines are like black and white outline drawings that require the color of emotion to become psychologically incorporated as a living, forceful presence. The arts in rights engage and shape emotion, thereby inducing memory of historical and subsistence information in a non-literate society where everything must be remembered. So the arts and rites and rituals as a mode of remembering when you can't write down. Although art-filled ceremonial practices themselves may or may not resolve the immediate vital problems that are their proximate motivation, they address and satisfy other physical and psychological needs. Through aesthetic operations, ceremonial practices create and reinforce emotionally satisfying and reassuring feelings of belonging to a group. Further, they provide to individuals a sense of meaningfulness or cognitive order and individual competence insofar as they give emotional force to explanations of how the world came to be as it is and what is required to maintain it. They coordinate and unify group members in a feeling of one-heartedness. All these effects contribute to psychological homeostasis and thus to individual survival and reproductive success, i.e. fitness. So she's arguing art allows us to pass down information, even in illiterate societies, and that also by stress reduction and by, by um, congealing, by, by bringing societies together, it ensures survival. I, I almost feel like, and this is, these are my words, but it's like the development of the brain when we have to face death, when we have to face all sorts of things that we have no control over and that are scary to us and we have to project about them into the future. It's so stressful that we had to develop these coping mechanisms in order to maintain the, the advantages of our cognitive abilities, or rather, <laughs> in order to survive our cognitive abilities. For these reasons, I question the explanatory power of the sexual selection hypothesis, with its emphasis on the arts as originating or persisting primarily as indications of personal fitness. Certainly, costly display may indicate fitness and hence sexual desirability, or preferred shapes, colors, and movements may provide criteria for mate choice. However, it should not be forgotten that costliness, specialness, may also signal, look at how important this is and see how much I, we, care about this. Because in ritual performances, the artistic effort that is given to assure good outcomes is indexical to the importance they are felt to have, it is not surprising that people use skill, expense, and excess of all kinds to demonstrate their emotional investment in the object or event they choose to artify. She's not saying this, but it's almost like she is distinguishing between group fitness and individual fitness. We can't really separate an individual human survival from group survival so much. For example, shields that are used for protection in hunting or warfare, as by uh, Maasai men of East Africa or numerous groups in Papua New Guinea, could hypothetically be made of just a plain, strong plank of wood. Such shields, however, are invariably decorated, not simply with adaptably relevant colors and forms, but with carefully carved or painted motifs. Although the motif's power resides in their supposed magic potency, 
They are not simply scrawled onto the wood. On the contrary, they must be made with care. Not to display one's virtuosic painting or carving ability for admiring females, but so that they will work. Although I would like to agree in general that the sexual selection hypothesis is not so compelling as a hypothesis because it leaves a lot of stuff out. Here I don't really understand um, how the fact that someone might believe in a certain society that these carvings make a shield work mean that it's not about sexual selection. I don't really understand how those two things connect. Similarly, young males who undergo scarification for rites of manhood are not randomly slashed, although any sort of cut would presumably demonstrate their ability to bear pain manfully. Because what the scars will indicate is important, the state of adulthood. They are placed carefully and symmetrically on the face or body of the initiate. The Trobriander's ceremonial kula, seagoing canoe, masawa, is carved perfectly, whereas carving is often indifferent in fishing canoes and non-existent in personal ones. Beauty, skill, and high cost signal to higher powers, to others, to one's group, and to oneself, the supreme importance of the artifact or occasion. So she just is saying it seems to her that artification is there to delineate something which is meant to be seen as important to, to kind of it's like a highlighter and not a highlighter of the individual it's a highlighter of, of usually of a thing or an idea for example adulthood or fishing so the next subsection is called um, number six is called implications of a humanity-centered or adaptationist model of the arts only an adaptationist paradigm can address two important and incontrovertible facts about the implied subject of humanistic study, or humanity. First, all people who have lived during the past 250,000 years have been members of one species and, like other species, share a common nature, human nature. Comprehending this fact is essential for contemporary understanding of world art, as of world history, religion, health, education, or any other human subject. Second, the human mind and the behaviors and artifacts it produces are biologically based. That is, the result of the electrochemistry, an anatomical structure of the brain that has evolved like other parts of the body to help individuals survive and reproduce. So that's where uh, she's breaking down the mind-body dualism. She says, no, that it's all biology. Because all individuals have similar emotional needs and motivational structures, it is obsolete and limiting to treat human behavior as being only culturally or individually constructed. So it is not only culture and it is not only the individual. Human cultures have developed as ways of addressing and satisfying evolved individual emotional needs and motivations. In other words, all cultures have devised ways of dealing with their members' vital concerns and, as I have shown, the arts are integral parts of this armamentarium. As arts are part of culture, artifying or making special is part of biology. So there, she's just really restating the fact that artifying and making special, the act which she is her synonym for, the act of making art, is a biological manifestation or it's a manifestation of our biology. The concept of making special is congruent with a number of valued premises in contemporary humanistic study. It supports such aims as re-examination and re-evaluation of orthodox anthropological and aesthetic assumptions, Marcus and Fisher, 1999, and provides good arguments against hierarchical thinking, or us versus them, and for pluralism. Whether in or out of the academy, the problem of cultural bias is lessened if we understand that all cultures address biologically important matters and that the arts have evolved as integral parts of dealing with these. She's coming back again to her original thesis, this idea that we need to think um, of art more universally, avoid this hierarchical, um, culturally, let's say, um, looking at art through a cultural lens, and we need to think of it as uh, biologically so that we can find some kind of universal meaning to it. Additionally, the concept provides a general and superordinate term for a universal human behavior that helps us to understand the different arts in different societies to be instances of the same underlying propensity. In other words, everything from Michelangelo to uh, contemporary performance art to um, the Maso uh, uh, canoes uh, to um, the you know ceremonial dances uh, wherever you know in the Arctic, everything is part of the same underlying human propensity. 
Because the behavior is operationalized as formalization, exaggeration, elaboration, repetition, and manipulation of expectation, one can recognize its manifestations both in the field and as described by earlier scholars. That is, the concept skirts such perennial and insoluble problems as defining art, i.e. our gift presentation, or the Japanese tea ceremony, art. It further makes clear that the arts are not quote, disinterested, but as making special, are performative and experienced multimodally as an integral part of life. So she's explaining why she thinks her approach to understanding why we might make art and how it's an underlying human propensity that's in our genes, kind of. You know, she says we avoid all these kind of never-ending discussions about what is art. And it also makes clear that art is not disinterested, that it's not separate from everyday life almost, or it's not, in, it, it is integral to life. Making special shifts the subject of study from art as an object or product, essence, cue, opinion, label, preference, or experience to what people do or accomplish, the operations of making special. And it reframes aesthetics to the larger matter of when and why people do it. Studies of the arts of an individual or so society can be recast within the framework and then compared with similar what, when, and why questions of another individual or society. So she says it also, her conception of art also shifts the focus from um, art as an object um, and, and also kind of from um, art as something we must judge to art as the question of what do people accomplish and why do people do it. So we get away from this endless defining towards uh, the why. Studies of the arts of an individual or society can be recast within this framework and then compared with similar what, when, and why questions of another individual or society. The ways that different groups artify the various values themselves, i.e. subsistence, safety, prosperity, health, social harmony, reciprocity, social role, status, can also be a relevant basis for comparative studies. Uh, so like any good academic, she's leaving this open. She's saying, I'm offering this to you as a method or a lens through which to see and to, to, to further explore the subject. Similarly, the study of meaning, symbols, and language can be enriched with adaptationist understanding of why humans evolved to have and use these capacities and when and why, not only how, meanings are so often artified. Meaning ultimately and necessarily reduces to biological meaning which is felt emotionally. I believe what that sentence means is that emotions often signal our biological needs. So given that there's so much emotion around art, um, you know, it's a signal of our biological needs. Because humans generally artify biologically and psychologically important things, artifications are a useful index to the values of a group or individual and an additional way of identifying those values. Finally, an understanding that making special is inherent in all societies and individuals compels awareness that the subject of art is of particular and commanding interest and consequence within humanistic studies and to human life itself. The current postulate that art has no biological or functional importance has real-world implications outside academic theory. It echoes the traditional Western elitist assumption of art for art's sake and contributes to the broader cultural atmosphere that increasingly reduces support of art programs in schools and communities. So she ends on a very concrete political note, speaking to her own culture, saying these cuts to art programs, how art is funded, how elitist it is, that is a manifestation of a really erroneous approach to art that we have. And if we understand it as a biological function, that um, alleviates this, this approach and casts a totally different light on how we should fund art and how we should think of art in our society today. I hope you got something out of this essay and my reading of it. If you've listened this far, please do consider subscribing wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. The best way to keep up to date with artists on the verge is to sign up for the newsletter, which I send on the 13th of every month. And most importantly, if the themes of this podcast speak to you, get in touch. I would like to build a community of like-minded artists around this platform. All relevant links are in the description. Here's to being on the verge. <laughs> <laughs>